This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Um, today we have John Zimmerman, from, who's an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon at the HCI, the HCII, which is the Human Computer Interaction Institute, and also at the School of Design. And uh, before CMU, John was actually at Philips, where he did a lot of work with interactive television. And today he's going to be talking to us about designing for the self. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm uh, speaking today about some new work that I'm doing. I think uh, a lot of times when people come and, and do some of our talks, they talk about work that's mature, that they actually believe in quite a bit. Um, but I want to share with you some, a new area that I'm going into and actually get some feedback on whether you think this is an exciting area, which I, I believe, um, or if I'm just sort of wandering, wandering off, which is very likely. Uh, just a quick overview. I'm going to just touch a little bit on my background and how it informs this work. Um, offer a representative example of what I mean by designing for the self. Um, my motivation, which is sort of very tangential to this work, uh, a fundamental disconnect that I think exists between uh, uh, some great work done by consumer behavior researchers and between the way HCI is practiced, um, some product opportunities, and finally how I'm trying to operationalize this work in my own design practice. So my background is actually in filmmaking. Um, uh, which I think is a type of product design, but it's really a, a basis of storytelling, and it's an approach that I bring to all of the design work that I do today. Um, and I moved from filmmaking to multimedia, which wasn't a particularly big step at the time, um, but early interactive CD-ROMs and very early websites. So my sort of formative years of doing web was back before you had tables and HTML and before Photoshop had layers, um, mask graphics. Um, after spending a number of years doing interactive multimedia, I uh, joined Philips, um, worked in their research lab doing interactive television, which was a great place to sort of leverage some of my filmmaking skills to look at what applications people would have in their homes. And while I was there, I became sort of grounded in the idea that designers can perform research um, and became very interested in interactive uh, interaction with intelligent systems. And for the last four years I've been at Carnegie Mellon of uh, teaching design and doing research on how people interact with intelligent systems. And this is sort of very unrelated to that work, but I'm just trying to figure out how to bridge the design for the self and intelligent systems together. So just uh, to set the stage for what I'm talking about, I'll give you a sense of, of what I mean through an example of a grocery store checker. So hopefully this is uh, an example that you're all familiar with. Um, not the sort of modern self-checkout, but sort of right previous to that, when um, laser scanners were first starting to be used in the grocery store. And to me, this is an excellent example of HCI practice, where a, a design team went in, they surveyed the situation, and they designed a system that effectively makes the checker much more efficient and much more accurate at the work that they perform. Um, so what does adding an identity lens to this design practice really bring us. And in this approach, you really have to consider what are the identity goals of the user, and in this case, the worker. Does the interaction with the laser scanner make the checker feel like they're a better checker in the performance of their work? Um, and I, I would argue that it actually does not. That they went from a system where they're entering in a 10-key system where they're using the machine as a tool to get the work done, and now the, the HCI designers have created this situation where they work for the machine. They're in a very subservient role, um, and they've gone from sort of being the checker to being a barcode orienter. So their, their job, you know, the conveyor belt's bringing the food in, and their job is to just orient the barcode and move it along. Um, 
And this is this sort of servitude that they have with the machine is done in a very social context so that the customer is actually watching them work for the machine. And it creates this very unpleasant situation and it creates a sense of de-skilling. It's like this focus on ease of use is really about, well, how can we get the lowest skilled worker to do this job with no sense of what is it that people get out of the work that they're doing. And this is hardly a radical or new or, or, or you know, a blinding insight. I think you can look back at examples like the quality circles done in the automotive industry to reduce defects was this process of trying to get workers engaged in what they were making, trying to think about how do we bring challenge into the work, stimulate the workers, and make them have some ownership of what they're doing. Not a big consideration, I think, in HCI. So um, just to touch very briefly on my motivation and what, uh, what HCI talk wouldn't be complete without a picture of O.J. Simpson's car chase? I think this is like a, a great example for, for HCI. Um, but personally, I've had a, just a tremendous fascination with celebrity for a long, long time. And what I love about this example um, is that shortly after this, this nationally televised chase, the sales of white Ford Broncos increased. That's fascinating to me because you're seeing this real effect from this completely unintentional event. Um, but there's a behavior here. There's, there's, there's this influence that's going on and how can we as designers and makers of things operationalize this type of behavior in the products we make. Um, and I, I became not quite obsessed but certainly very interested with this idea of can I make a celebrity, can I make a product that exerts this level of attachment and this level of influence. And I spent a number of years really exploring what's the relationships that products play in allowing people to form relationships with celebrities, sort of the construction of a parasocial relationship. Um, and in the end, I actually just found it tremendously uh, difficult to operationalize. I couldn't make a synthetic celebrity and create the social effect because I needed like a set of 100,000 users that I could give sort of a social effect to. And uh, in general, every place I work and brought this idea up, the lawyers would say, well, you can't really go out and take a celebrity's image and, and use it in your work because you're degrading their copyright. So it became sort of a very much a non-starter. But for me, it also it, it opened this idea that identity construction and sort of this pursuit of identity or understanding who we are is this huge motivator of people's behavior. Um, and I became very interested in how I could explore this force and use this force as a product designer. So what's this disconnect? So uh, for about the last 20 years, consumer behavior researchers have been exploring and, and constructing theory around how people form attachments to products through this process of identity construction. Um, and it was sort of frustrating for me at this point in my career to come across this because as a designer this is nothing that we ever talked about in design school and it certainly was nothing we ever talked about in practice. Um, and I think if you look at HCI practice today, there's this big focus on making functional artifacts for the world that meet people's needs but we're thinking of needs very much at a surface level and we're not looking at the underlying motivations for what people are really doing and I think the identity perspective gives us a sense of getting very much below the surface and really trying to operationalize our understanding of people in a new way. So uh, a big question and, and what I'm trying to do is, is this question of why care um, and I'm trying to, to, to make people care about this but I think fundamentally it has to do with what you think HCI practice is. Where, where is it? Where's the edge of it? Um, and what is it trying to accomplish? And in general, everywhere I go, I, I have no trouble convincing people that HCI practice is usability engineering, that there's this very big focus on making things that people can successfully use. And for myself, sort of doing interaction design um, in the late 80s and early 90s, that was the focus. It was very much, can we make things that are, are easy to use? So the idea of ease of use and user-friendly were the, the core mantras. Um, I think it becomes much more difficult when we start to ask the questions of do HCI practitioners design work? 
They certainly design tools for work, but do they design the work itself and do they engage it in a holistic sense? Um, and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure that's not actually what's happening in practice, but I'm wondering if the community is ready to take that on. They definitely design products, but do they think of it in a, in a holistic sense of the constellation of products that people intersect um, in their lives? Design of service, I think this is a new area and um, there's a lot of resistance to HCI moving in this direction. And finally, this idea of designing for experience. So if you frame this in the work sense, I think um, HCI practitioners have no trouble thinking about work because it's a very controlled environment and as a designer you can sort of impose your will and control a lot of the attributes that take place. But as soon as you start talking about designing for experience of interacting with people sort of across a broad spectrum of their lives, the designers lose a lot of control of what's happening, of what people bring, of what their expectations are. And I think coming from sort of a, a cognitive discipline that, that sort of founded HCI, this is a very difficult space for lots of people to feel like they want to move into. But as a designer, I, I think this is the richest area for us to explore. So a number of people have um, begin, begun to sort of construct some frameworks for talking about how HCI might move into this um, space. I'm guessing most of you are familiar with Don Norman's work on product emotions, where he's also talking about product attachment, but I think in a fundamentally different way. And while I, I like this work in that it helps us deconstruct products and understand what they are, I actually don't think they, it helps us at all in making things. Um, and I think fundamentally it talks about uh, product emotions at a very surface structure level um, and it almost gets down to the point of well we can make stuff that works and now we can make stuff that works that's pretty and, and we're there. And I think there's a lot more to it than that. Um, other models, I don't know if you guys know Pat Jordan's work, he runs the Contemporary Trends Institute, came up with the model of the four pleasures uh, in interacting with products. He's a usability engineer who spent a number of years at Philips. Um, so he talks about the physio physiological pleasure of using a product, social pleasure, psychological pl pleasure, and ideological pleasure. And he creates this Maslowian uh, period, uh, pyramid of needs where at the bottom is the base functionality. Does the product do what the person needs it to do? And then there's the usability need. Can the person successfully get the product to do what it wants? And finally at the top is pleasure. Um, and again, I think this is a, a great model for deconstructing products, but not a great model for trying to figure out what to make, particularly because if you take an identity perspective and say people actually have a functional need to discover who they are through the use of the product, then pleasure and functionality can't be separated by usability. They have to actually be together. That the pleasure is actually in the functionality. Um, one model I do particularly like is some work by Jody Forlizzi, who's a colleague of mine, and Shannon Ford, um, looking at the idea that the interaction with a product uh, or the interface of a product is a mediator and it's really connecting people to people, people to places, and people to products. And that it all takes place in uh, a context where you have social, cultural, and economic forces at play. And this is really the space that we're trying to design in. Um, the work I'm doing on identity, I think, just augments it by adding a different perspective to this, to this model. So what can consumer behavior researchers tell us? What is it that they're saying that we as a, a community aren't hearing? Um, and going back sort of more than 100 years, you have Williams James really stating with clarity that people are what they possess. And uh, the example I'm using here, uh, a fairly extreme example, is that a mother is a mother through the possession of the child. Without a, a child, are you a mother? Um, and what's the role of that possession and what are the roles of all of our possessions in our lives that make us who we are? Um, People, they have the basic idea that people construct themselves through the stuff that they have and people form strong attachments to products that they feel represent who they are, who they were, or who they want to be. Um, some evidence for this uh, is particularly in the negative. So if you talk to people who have lost all of their possessions in a fire, they've experienced a real loss of their self, like they don't un actually understand who they are. 
Um, other examples, if you talk to people who have lost a child or a spouse, they're fundamentally a different person through the loss of this possession. And that just becomes a, a view to understand what that attachment is. So um, one of the sort of best works, a, a real seminal work that's, that brings this all together is by Russell Belk. It's an article called Possessions and the Extended Self. And those of you that maybe come from a so, uh, social, psychological background may have already read this. Um, but it's the idea that people extend themselves through their possessions and you have a sense of things that are closer to you. So you can start to talk about your body as a possession, like is your body you? Um, if you cut off your arm, is that you or is it sort of extended from you? Um, the things that you keep around you, the people in your lives, the places you inhabit. So it's this sort of very broad definition of what a possession is, more than just what we might consider a, a commercial product. And so when I use the term product, I'm generally thinking in this much larger sense of possession. And that really the measurement of connection and attachment is based on what we consider this distance from the self to the extended self. Um, and I, I like the framing of this, of thinking of the self, that you know, we can step outside of ourselves. You know, the self is sort of what lets us look back and see the I. It's like we can gain distance and, and reflect. I mean, Belk work, uh, Belk's work really builds on Sartre, talking about the three states of existence of having, doing, and being. Um, and this is a model of social construction. So we have things in order to engage in doing. So I have this bottle of water, and then I can engage in drinking water. So without the possession, I can't get there. And in sort of imagining what it would be like to have the product, and imagining what it would be like to use the product, I have this conversation with myself of who I will be in relationship to the product. In addition, people go out into the world and they possess products, they use products, they look at how people react to them, and sort of through both the imagined conversations and the actual interactions in the real world, they, become, they, they come to understand who they are in relationship to the product. And again, a, as a designer, this is sort of frustrating for me to be coming to this kind of theory, what I consider so late in my design career, that this is fundamentally what we actually try to do, but we don't have a way of talking about it. Um, another sort of great theory, uh, some early work by Erickson and, and some later work by Klein, Klein, and Allen, um, takes this perspective of life narratives. And this, you know, the basic idea of a life narrative is that people have a current understanding of who they are, a, cur uh, a current understanding of who they were that they want to hold on to, and a current understanding of who they were that they want to forget. And that through our relationships with products, we construct both our present and our past. And our sort of attachment is in this way. And as we discard things, we are discarding aspects of ourselves that we no longer want to hold on to. And that sort of the, product, the attachments we feel to products are basically as markers in our life's stories that give us sense of our connection to this past. Um, and the Klein, Klein, and Allen. Um, sort of tried to formalize this by saying you could plot your possessions, really looking at the prized possessions. So what are, what are the things you cherish the most, love the most, in three-dimensional space. Um, and sort of the two main dimensions are autonomy and affiliation. So what are the products that make me feel like me as an individual? And what are the products that give me a sense of affiliation to the groups that I want to be affiliated to? And a number of people's most prized possessions had strong aspects of both. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And that these markers and attachments are really constructed through the present of, of how I feel about myself now and through the past. And that who I'm trying to be doesn't actually give me an attachment to a product. But I only have attachments to things I already have and to sort of this looking back marker. And this is a very reflective process and I think sort of kind of matches nicely with Norman's idea of product emotions um, in reflection, but I think the, this theory gives us a much better sense of how we might make things. Um, the Kleins working with Kernan did some interesting work applying social identity theory to uh, consumer product relationships. Uh, and the 
the main aspect here is they were really considering role and what what is the role of role of social roles in understanding how people form attachments to products and the, the core elements here are the social role that people enact and then the social identity and the ideal identity. Now, I just want to break this down without getting too theoretical to try to understand where eventually later where the product opportunities might be. So a, a social role in this sense is a role somebody will enact and their sense of that role is based on all of the positive and negative examples they've had of that role both through the people they've met through the stories they've told and the media that they have consumed. So for myself, like the idea of what it means to be a father is based on sort of all of these examples that I've had. And then in addition, uh, people create a social identity, which is who they think they are in the role through their own enactment, that has very much positive and negative aspects to it. Like, well, I'm kind of good at this and I kind of suck at this when I'm engaged in this role. And then they have an ideal identity of who it is they really want to be in this role. And this can sort of be very fractured in that people can want mutually exclusive attributes. So if I'm thinking of the role of a college student, I could desperately want to be a straight A student and want to party every night. And that's just fine in an ideal identity because it doesn't have to be holistic. So in the, the work done by Klein, Klein, and, and Kernan, they were really looking at this sense of attachment and in the experiments they ran what they noticed was that the attachments were much stronger to the roles people enacted than to the core self. And it was this balanced relationship between people's social identity of who they thought they were in the role and their idealized identity. Um, and what's interesting here is this becomes the channel through which people consume new products. So this is what I'm buying. And it's only through that channel that a product then has the chance to form an attachment and gain sort of this meaning by becoming a part of my life narrative. And again, the relationships are to this, this broader sense of, of product, of, of the people that are important, the products people actually interact with, um, and the places that they inhabit. So trying to put it all together, um, in looking at these models, they're, they're talking about how products play a very passive role in this process of identity construction. Um, and that people are really possessing things in order to use them and it's sort of through their possession and use that they gain an attachment and an understanding. Um, that attachment is very much through this sense of affiliation. So how does it bind me to a group that I'm particularly interested in, in being connected with? And through autonomy. How does this allow me to express an individuality about myself in a way that's important? Um, and finally, that the things we desire to bring into our lives are really a construction of who we are in the moment and who it is we desire to be through the specific roles that we interact. Um, and I just bring out this quote from Fight Club, uh, which I think is a nice framing. You are not your car. You are not your bank account. You are not the contents of your wallet. You are not your grande latte. You are not your khakis. Um, and I'd say, you know, there's a, a a social movement to try to convince people that they're not their products and yet the research is really revealing that they are. And the disconnect I think here is that you're not any individual product but you're the empowerment to pick and choose which collection of products make you who it is you want to be. So going back to the idea of the, the experience model of, of interfaces or, or really products as being mediators that connect people and people, people and places, and people and products. What an identity perspective adds to this that I think is sort of very fundamental is that products connect people back to themselves. And in designing things, how do we consider how does what it is I'm making help someone both understand who it is they are and move towards who it is that they might want to be? So where do we go from here? Can we design interactive products that help people move towards their ideal identity of themselves? Um, generally, I don't think that's a question people ask in HCI practice. But should we? And should we have a way of measuring if that's successful? Can we design products that scaffold the process of identity construction by, instead of having products play this very passive role where they're picked and sort of brought in, can a product actually play a role in helping people through 
the changes that they go through. Um, and finally, can we make products that make people feel better about themselves, where that's actually fundamentally what we're trying to evaluate in their success? So in sort of looking at, at, at this theory, a whole bunch of other theories, considering my own design practices, I tried to synthesize this down and find some opportunity areas where I thought it was particularly rich for interaction designers to explore and for uh, uh, interactive products to emerge. And there's four main areas. Um, the sort of last two are the two I'm most interested in. Um, but the first is role expression. There's role switching, role enhancement, and role transition. I want to touch on each of these briefly um, to give a sense of what the opportunity is. So role expression isn't, isn't particularly novel, but it's the idea of customization and personalization. And I, I know for myself, so I, I use the Nike example here. I think it's actually an excellent example of sort of giving people control of what, what the product might be. Um, and I know for myself as a designer, I've often been working on interactive products where a product manager will come in and say, people love to customize their stuff. People love to personalize it. So let's add that in. And I think generally that's how it's talked about without actually understanding what is it that somebody's trying to accomplish through customization and personalization. And if we have a clearer understanding of what their goal is, do we fundamentally change what we allow them to customize or personalize or the process they go through to do this? Role switching um, is really the idea that people enact a whole bunch of different roles. And can we design products that play a part in the actual switching, where I go from one role to another. Uh, and the ego phone is a, a great example of this. It's worked by um, Yun Chao Chung, uh, who used to be at Motorola and is now at, at Microsoft. I um, mean, it, it works a lot like uh, instant messaging um, in that you can express your availability, in this case, across multiple communication channels. So you can do your mobile phone, your instant messaging, and your email. Sort of, what's my availability? But you can do it to the different groups. So you're segmenting by relationships. So I can say, well, to these people, I'm available only by I am. But to these people, I'll take your phone call if you call me on your mobile phone. And it's the idea that you manage it. And the, the phone worked um, in such a way that if you were receiving incoming calls, you knew which of the you's they were calling. So you had sort of, instead of having distinctive rings by your friends that were calling, you actually had distinctive rings by the you they were trying to reach. Um, role enhancement, uh, opportunity number three, really gets back to the idea of the checker. How can we make people feel better about the roles? In this case, how do, how do I make a product that makes the checker feel like they're better at their job through the use of the product? Um, so uh, I teach an interaction design course. And for a long time, I've been torturing my students with this project of designing music players. Um, and for me, it's as a, a great space for students to explore because there's this sort of very limited set of functionality that's not particularly difficult. Students have a great understanding of it, but people have this great emotional relationship with music. So how can we mine that space looking for intrinsic value? And as I moved into this uh, new area of identity construction, I've been pushing my students to explore this. So one of my teams was trying to design a music player for moms. And what does that mean? And looking both at their functional needs, so in this case, they needed to entertain their kids. Um, the kids were always sort of bothering them when they were trying to get the maintenance work of their life done. And they needed a music player for their workout to shield them from sort of the monotony and the pain of exercise. These are real needs, and I, I think that's what music players do. Um, but they were also exploring a whole bunch of identity needs and then trying to sort of pick and choose which are the identity needs we could actually manifest in a product. So they were looking at this need for moms to connect to their children through the artifacts that their children make. So how can they sort of express their love through the things that their children make for them? And then sort of, of um, next to that is this idea of sharing the artifacts their children make with others, particularly other moms, to show what their children have done. And again, it's this expression of love. And it's this big part of what it means to be a mom. So the students designed a music player made up of these little wedges. And if you push a button on the back, it plays a two-second sample. Each wedge might hold like four or five songs on it. Um, and sort of pushing the side of the back moves where that sample is within the song. 
so that the kids can play with this and create these sort of select these different two second samples and then um, assemble it into a circle and hit play and it'll play a unique composition based on the samples that they've made. So the kids sort of get this toy to play with. It, it, it makes this composition. It also constructs the playlist for the mom of the songs that she'll hear when she's working out. And then the mom has this artifact she can take with her into the world and as she runs across other moms she can like, oh this is what my child made for me. And can share this sort of within the artifact. Well, and I, I want to say there's no sense that this would actually be a commercial product. It's not really what the students are, are, are looking at. But it's this idea of, of just sort of very rapidly we can begin to sort of look for identity needs and start to think about how they come into products. And then do we make things that are more meaningful. Um, role transition I think is probably the best uh, space for investigating identity uh, products. An example of these are like high school students who have to shed who they are as a high school student and discover who they, who they want to be as a college student, which is sort of an exciting and also frightening time. Um, a couple that has a, a baby for the first time and has to discover who they are as a family. Um, a smoker choosing to quit smoking and have to reinvent themselves and, um, and their interactions with other people as a non-smoker. And uh, uh, I think a, a really rich area is adult children who have to take on a caregiving role and their elder parents who have to take on a care receiving role after a lifetime of playing the opposite roles. Um, and I think they sort of go from happy to uh, less happy and just sort of very uncomfortable at the bottom. The triggers for these are time of life, um, a life event, or a personal choice. Um, and in, in sort of trying to find product examples in this space, there really aren't any. I think it's a completely underdesigned area. So for the people that are really struggling with these things, there are therapists, life coaches, support groups to really get people over the hump. But that hits a very small segment of society and you have to think a lot of people are going through transitions a lot of the time. Um, at a lower level, particularly with a sense of affiliations, so when somebody's joining a group, there are professional um, and social organizations and discussion groups which help get people acclimated into groups. Um, and then there's been some interesting work looking at how people use web pages and <coughs> blogs as a way of creating a digital self that they can sort of experimentally try to discover who it is they want to be. So. I've sort of looked at a lot of theory, tried to find some, some space where design um, can have some opportunities, and then in my own practice I've really been trying to operationalize this to understand how should I go about making things and how does sort of understanding what identity construction is, how does that actually come out to play and, and where are the rich areas. So the first example uh, I want to talk about is a project called Digital Self. And it's looking at high school students as they enter college. Um, and they're really trying to shed that identity and, and discover who it is they want to be. Um, and this is such a great group to study because they're so excited about the idea of coming to college. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons I definitely chose this group to look at. The other is because working at a university I have an endless supply of, of incoming freshmen sort of each year. I get a new group to look at. And so um, this is my research team. I'm working with some, some juniors, seniors, and uh, master students. And we're tracking first uh, 20 first year students as they sort of have their first experiences at Carnegie Mellon. And we're looking at how they're constructing digital selves. So we're looking at their, their blogs, their online diaries, their Flickr pages, their Facebook pages to really understand how are they using these resources to invent themselves. Um, and we're, our, our goal coming out of this is to really design products that scaffold the transition that they're going through. And so uh, sort of just to give us a focus setting going in, we sat down and tried to come up with product ideas with absolutely no data, which is I think actually a, a fun place to start to see how wrong you are when you reflect back at the end of the proj project. Um, but one of the, the early ideas that came out was this idea of a mobile content acquisition tool that maybe um, when they're trying to create these digital artifacts, they're in the world, they're seeing stuff. It's like, oh, I'd like that. How do I get that? And How do I get that up on my digital self? The other is uh, sort of related, a digital pin or pasteboard for collecting 
materials that they find in the world or they find through reflection. Um, for particularly social networking software and for web pages, something that tracks the history and allows people to reflect so they can see the changes that have taken place and to make the process of the identity construction more explicit. Um, and finally, some content capture exercises um, designed to help people more fully explore the range of possibilities they have in inventing who it is they want to be. And so sort of part of the driver is this idea that um, people are generally not aware that they're even going through this identity transition. And if we make it clearer to them, do we make the quality of the transition more pleasurable? Or do we make it worse and we just make them more neurotic? We'll find out. Um, so we're, we're doing a very standard user-centered design process where we're conducting a lot of interviews with the students about their process of doing this. And we're also weekly capturing their digital selves to see how they change over time. Um, and we're, you know, getting the kind of information you would expect. Um, but we're doing a, a more interesting, uh, we're using a more interesting method that we're sort of still crafting to get at these aspects of what's the social role, what's their social identity, what's their ideal identity. These are like very difficult questions to just go out and ask them. So what's your social identity as you see yourself as a college student? And so we're asking them to take pictures of things. And so we'll say, like, take three pictures of things that you think people associate with college students. And then take three pictures of things that you think people associate with college students that you would never want associated with you. Take three, uh, three pictures of things that you use in your role as a college student. And take three pictures of things that you desire as a college student. And this is, this is given us a lot of sort of really interesting stuff back and I think it's actually really easy for the students to find pictures of things without necessarily understanding why they're choosing these things and we're leaving that sort of up to us in the interpretation. Um, some early findings, not so surprisingly, people's digital selves often don't match the people we interview. Um, and as, as an example, there's, there's two women in uh, participants who have presentations of themselves that my design team call angry women. Um, I think of like sort of Alanis Morissette. They're angst-filled, they're angry, they're going to change the world. And the first thing my researchers said when they came back was they were so nice. These were like the nicest people I've met. And that there's this real disconnect between this self that they're putting out and who they actually are. And it's really interesting to see that they really are testing out, is this what it means to be a college student? Is this what I want to be as a college student? Um, there's another participant who um, friended, I believe, 800 people over the summer on Facebook. This is somebody that didn't have a lot of friends in high school, was looking, I guess, to be super popular in college, was trying to use this tool to reinvent themselves, and now has become known as the Facebook guy on campus, which is not necessarily where they want to be. And it raises the question of, should the software have let him do this? Do we, as designers, actually have a responsibility to keep people from doing things that are socially damaging that they may not recognize? Um, interestingly enough, while we really thought there'd be this great interest in mobile content acquisition, what we're hearing back is actually people have this huge interest in content browsing. They want to see other people's profiles mobily, and which is sort of disheartening for me, is that they want to do it in class. Um, and hopefully that doesn't have a lot to say about our content. But we suspect a lot of it is sort of you're sitting in class, you sort of have to take yourself back to your, to your first year. You're seeing other people you recognize from around campus and you're trying to see who is that. And I want to get that information. I'm not, I don't quite have the social currency to go up and talk to them. Um, In, in the task of having them all take pictures of things they thought people associated with college students but they would never want associated with them, of all the 20 students, they all took pictures of beer, which was this just tremendous consistency that we didn't expect. And I think both myself and my research team, you know, who the youngest who are, who are in their junior year, we have this idea of college that's very much framed on the culture of Carnegie Mellon. Like that's what college means to us, it's sort of very idiosyncratic where beer isn't actually a big part of the culture. So for us, it's this tremendous surprise. 
but coming from high school where their idea of what college is is much more media based um, and sort of based on the stories that filter back through their friends that have moved on, it's much clearer for us to see why that is and we're very interested to see if that persists or if as they become indoctrinated in the, the culture of this institution, do they actually change that perception. Um, and in sort of looking at the, the objects they desire, we saw this really interesting transition. So at first, the pictures they were showing were things like, I want a surround sound system, I want a sports car, I want a new mobile phone. And that was like in the first, first week, second week, we're seeing those kinds of things. A month in, we're seeing things like, I want an umbrella, I want a jacket, I want a backpack. And that there's this, this move to very much practicality to the things to just kind of survive as a college student. Um, additionally, in sort of looking at the products that they use, at first it was sort of very tech-centric. We saw a lot of laptops, we saw a lot of mobile phones, and about a month in, we started seeing things like Tide, um, an alarm clock. That their moms aren't there to get them up and get them to school and to do these household chores and this reality of what it means to be a college student is just hitting them. And again, we don't design products with the expectation of this, this change. And so in, in exploring these students, we're trying to figure out, you know, like what design methods can we use to develop a product for doing this. And I, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with the persona model that, uh, of Cooper's where you sort of try to reduce your user into this sort of canonical user, but it's reduced down to a single person. We're taking that approach, but we're actually trying to do it over time. So we're, we're looking at our, our participants, and we're reducing them down to sort of, this is a persona of a college student in their first week. And then this is a persona of their college student after a month. And this is a persona of a college student after midterms. And, and track them through and then sort of by looking at this set of personas, can we design a product that lives in that life, uh, life cycle and actually adds value throughout the entire process. We don't know what that'll be and we don't know if we can do it, but it's a lot of fun so far. Um, the next project uh, is a work I'm doing with Anin Day, uh, who used to be at Berkeley, is now at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and it's looking at, well, it's a project we call Family Control in the Smart Home. And it's looking at what is the appropriate kind of assistance a smart home should give to a dual income family. Um, and this is very much, so while the last one was, was this role transition, this project is very much role enhancement, where our goal is really to make parents feel like good parents. And there are a bunch of reasons we sort of chose dual income families. The first is they're tremendous, uh, tremendously aggressive adopters and experimental users of communication technology. So for us, they seem to be a ripe group for Ubicomp. They're not afraid to bring technology in if it solves the problems in their lives. Um, additionally, they often feel like really crappy parents. And partly they're very sensitive to this because they've chosen to be dual income. So they feel like they're expressing to other people that their kids aren't so important to them or the role of parenting isn't important to them. Um, but also sort of the pressures of, of being a dual income parent prov provide a lot of opportunities for them to fail. And so from a design perspective, the idea of finding people that feel really crappy and making them feel better seems much easier than finding people that already feel good and making them feel better. So we're looking for sort of the low, entry to ba uh, low barrier to entry to figure out what this is. And looking at these dual income parents, the uh, Valerie Frisian sort of summarizes this up. They have this feeling of living in a permanent rush hour, that they've got just a million things to do, but they're just trapped in traffic. They just can't get anywhere. Um, and that basically everything in the world is working against them to hold them back. And can we? Can we reduce that feeling, making them feel better? Um, and in taking this identity perspective, it's allowed us to sort of recast this Ubicomp view or even this HCI view of control, which is really, you know, all the evaluation work that's been done is how can people control devices in their home? And the evaluation is, ah, yes, they could successfully control these devices. And what we're finding with the dual income family is they don't really care if they can control a device or not. What they want is control of their life. So instead of talking about what are all the things you can make your home do, really what is it that your home can do for you 
that's meaningful, that makes you feel better about yourself. And so we're trying to figure out how to measure this, but that's basically the evaluation approach that we're taking. Um, we spent a lot of time modeling all the information we're collecting. This is a tremendously inaccurate, but sort of as good as we can get so far model. Uh, where we start sort of at the bottom, where they have this identity goal to be a good parent. I just want to be a good parent. What does that mean, you know, in the sense of being a, a dual income parent? And that drives them to enroll their kids in a lot of enrichment activities. And this could be particularly an American cultural experience uh, where there's a high chance of layoff, uh, a lot of chance of sort of multiple careers. But there's this desire to instill in their children the skills they will need to be successful. And Enrolling them in these enrichment activities isn't just because your kid likes soccer or because you just need them basically taken care of for that time during the day, but that they're really gaining these life skills that will help them succeed. And because they're sort of engaged in all of these activities, there's this tremendous aspect of what Chuck Dara calls busyness. Um, he's an anthropologist at University of San Jose, and he sort of just has a new book coming out about the culture of busyness from his work looking at dual income families in Silicon Valley. Um, but it's just the idea that people have a million little details they have to manage constantly. And what the parents really strive to do is to effortlessly manage all of this busyness and to demonstrate that effortless mastery to their children because that's an important life skill their children will need to succeed. Um, because of all the busyness and because of deviation, so for example, a spouse, one of the two spouses goes away on a business trip, or the worst, the, the big fear everybody talks about is a child is sick. And all their careful planning to sort of get all of the work of the life done completely falls apart. And you experience huge breakdowns. I mean, and in general, these are, these are almost always driven by deviation. Um, and people feel this tremendous loss of control. So they're sort of torn. When everything works, they feel completely trapped by their schedule. They have no flexibility. I just have to like, be exactly where my calendar tells me every minute of the day. And when there are deviations, they have this complete breakdown and they feel their life is out of control. And, and our, our great example here is about orange slices. Um, so if you think of soccer as sort of this normal enrichment activity, the parents have to remember practice uniforms for practice days, away uniforms for games that are away, home uniforms for games that are home, all of the different locations where the events take place, uh, shin guards, different kinds of cleats for different surfaces. They can generally manage that. There's a lot of screaming, there's a lot of yelling, there's some tears, but it gets done. About every six weeks, the kid is responsible for bringing orange slices for halftime. That is a huge deviation from the normal routine, if you can even call it normal. But it's way outside of the daily routine. And there's this tremendous social pressure because your kid is potentially going to be the kid that forgot the orange slices. And, and that's not like forgetting your own cleats. That's letting the whole team down. And so you have these parents dropping their kids off not watching the game, they're driving to the grocery store, getting a plastic knife, trying to cut up these orange slices in time to deliver it. This does not make them feel good about their own parenting skills. To me, this is a tremendous opportunity for improvement by framing it from an identity, um, from an identity perspective. And so this, this loss of control really impacts their identity, and we're really looking for this sweet spot in the middle. Can we design products that help people feel in control and by helping them feel in control, do we actually make them feel like they're better parents? Um, in trying to explore this issue of identity, we don't have any great tools for like, well, here's how you, you do this kind of design. But the most important thing for us has just been sort of to, to look for it when we go out. So we look at a lot of calendars um, and sort of looking at, at activities families go through. This is just a, an example from one of our uh, 24 participant families. And if you'll notice on the 22nd, there's misfits written in huge letters on this day. Um, and in, in sort of probing on this, this is a play that their child is involved in. Um, the parents had no fear that they were going to forget this event. The reason it's written so large is that they're 
expressing sort of a construction of their family identity, so an expression to themselves and to other people that this play is very important to them, that their child's participation is important to them. And suddenly the calendar, which in most HCI practices is this construction of can we accurately represent all of the stuff that you need to do, becomes a manifestation of a projection of who the family is and what is important to them. And how do we, how do we bring that into the design of the calendars that we make? It works on paper because the paper doesn't require you to have those sets of rules, but when in a digital calendar there's a lot less flexibility. Do we lose these aspects? Um, so some design questions. Can the home help parents feel like better parents? That's the fundamental question that we're trying to figure out. Uh, if you think of the home as people's largest identity constructive object, your largest possession. It's a fabulous one in that it allows people to so easily imprint themselves on it. You get to pick the home you live in. You can decorate it with whatever furniture you want. You can paint the walls. If you have enough money, you can move the walls. You can really make it your own. And the home sort of passively receives this and allows you to change it. What happens when you begin to construct a smart home that's playing a much more active role? Do you fundamentally change what it means to be a home? We don't have an answer for this, but it's certainly an area that we, we feel we have to uh, grapple with in the design of our products. Um, another big question is when do devices become the home? So if you think of something like a toaster or a mixer, they, they feel very much like just a thing in the house that can be taken in and out. When you start to talk about a hot water heater and the electricity, the expression people have is that is the home itself. And at what point are we just making objects that are in the home? And at what point are we actually constructing what is the home and what actually might be left behind? Um, and when should, it, it really should the home actively participate in identity construction? Should it be going to parents and saying, wow, you did a really good job raising your kids today? Should it, it take that, that level of approach? I mean, we've been doing a lot of experience prototyping where we've been, um, you know, just sort of rapidly making smart homes that people can interact with that cross these boundaries. So for example, uh, we were looking at inter-parent communication and the smart home says to a mom, you know, a test mom come in and the home says, your husband told me you would do this. And we thought for sure we had completely crossed the boundaries of appropriate home behavior. And in fact we hadn't. People were like, okay. <laughs> because in the inter-spouse relationship just getting the work done was so important that they didn't care how they got the information. But as soon as the home was like, well, I'm going to call your friends and arrange transportation for your children, it was like, yeah, that's a lot of work, but no, you're not going to call any of my friends. That there was this need to control that relationship, even though you see it as much less intimate. Um, that was sort of a very interesting finding for us. Another one, at, at one point, our, our test smart home says, you've worked really hard today. You're being a good parent. Let me draw you a bath. And we thought, again, that's completely inappropriate behavior. We're going to find this barrier. And surprisingly, a number of the parents were really excited about this. And we're like, what the hell's going on? And sort of in probing on this, children never say thank you to their parents. And they're so starved for recognition of all the hard work they do. You know, to some degree, you remember 99 things, and the one thing you forget is the one your child comments on. <coughs> You forgot to, you know, you forgot to make eggs the way I like. It's like, you're lucky I made you anything. There, there's no recognition. And so the fact that the home was recognizing them, they were so starved, they would rather sort of take that falsely and have something to hold on to than sort of live in this very barren world. And so, again, we're just, we're pushing the boundaries and we're finding really interesting things and, and we're looking for where the rich space is. Um, so right now we're beginning to try to construct an activity manager. So we've done like a year of user research and we're, we're very much moving into building. Where we're going to focus on a, a system that can assist with the planning, coordination, and improvisation of all of the activities that the families um, engage in. And the focus here is really to reduce the breakdowns. To just, just to sort of make things function more smoothly by focusing on these deviations from routines and raising them up through a set of reminders. Um, and in, in sort of experience prototyping those things, we found, yeah, we can actually reduce breakdowns. We can reduce the, the number of collisions people have. But we really weren't getting at this aspect 
of making people feel better about themselves. And what we were particularly worried was that by making them able to sort of accomplish stuff better, would they just try to do more? Which means they're just in the same state. Yeah, they may be getting more done, but they feel just as crappy about themselves. And we're not getting that level of attachment with the product because they don't necessarily think this product is making me feel better about myself. So we've been playing around with these two themes, uh, a gifts of time and raising resources. And gifts of time really are opportunities the home can create for, uh, for the people in the house to focus their time and attention on someone else. And so if you think of an activity like cooking, a lot of parents really feel when they have the opportunity to cook for their children that they're, they're being a good parent. Even if their kids don't like what they made, they feel like they're really participating in that role because they're giving their time and attention. Um, and oftentimes, you know, what happens is the opportunity to cook is there and there's nothing to cook because they haven't engaged in the pre-planning to make it possible. But when we look at activities like making a grocery list, people were like, no, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of feeling about that. That doesn't make me feel like a good parent because I spent the time to organize all of the information. And so we're looking at a lot of the activities and really trying to figure out what are the activities that have this high identity quality and what are the activities that don't, and can we balance the type of automation so that we really weight it towards the activity that don't, uh, that don't make people feel like good parents. Um, another activity that was uh, particularly interesting in this space was dressing children, waking and dressing children in the morning, particularly young kids like four and under, which is where you're still dressing them. I guess they're not dressing teenagers. They just wish they could. Um, but that this generally, even with like a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old, is this tremendous struggle. There's yelling, there's screaming, there's I want to wear my, you know, I want to wear my Halloween costume every day. Um, but the parents didn't want the system to automate that. So even though it could often be a very unpleasant experience, it was one that made them feel like they were being a good parent, even if they were fighting with their child. And again, it, that's not tremendously an HCI view where we sort of look at reducing conflict through our products, but sometimes the conflict is good. We're just trying to increase opportunities for human interaction. Um, the idea of raising resources, we certainly were aware that parents were constantly looking for opportunities to raise their kids, to give them responsibilities. But it really came through in our experience prototype, where one of the, the, one of the scenarios we ran through are sort of parents walk by the dryer on their way to do something else, and the dryer reminds them, hey, your kid's clothes are in here. You should grab them now, and then you can put them away. The parents are like, don't tell me. Tell my kids. And this, this opened the idea for us of can the house and sort of the assistance it provides create opportunities as kids get older for parents to give responsibility to the children. That sort of it's going, the home will, in, in a sense, do less over time, not more. And again, that's not tremendously this, this traditional view of what smart homes are or should be. So I just want to try to wrap this up, my last slide. Bring this all back together and bring it back to identity construction. So for me at least, and I'm curious on your view, taking an identity perspective or this like designing for the self perspective provides a rich new insight for the way that experience design is done. Um, and I think it has the, the potential to transform the kinds of products and the processes of HCI practice. Um, if we're going to design things with the expectation of building stronger attachment and meaning, how, how can we find the space to do it? So I'm suggesting that we can make the process more explicit, so helping people understand that they're going through an identity process, that they are transforming, and that the product can help people define who they are and who they wish to be. Um, we can provide scaffolding, particularly for transitions, to help people through those times. Um, and we can focus on designing products that help people feel better about themselves and the roles they, en they enact, and in doing so, we'll, we'll develop these attachments. And I think this is a really rich area for interactive products in a way that, that traditionally sort of static products will never enjoy. So that is it for me. And I'm curious uh, to hear your questions. Your, your talk reminds me uh, most
mostly of the design of the Prius and, and how the American car companies actually, when they were looking at hybrid technology, said, well, you can't save enough money in gas to make up for the difference in price for this technology. And so they didn't do it, but they underestimated people's willingness to spend extra money to seem, or, you know, to feel ecological, to feel good about themselves and see themselves in that way. Does that kind of like fit into what you're, what you're talking about? Yeah, but I, maybe the companies were stupid because they're not paying attention to their own research. Why does somebody buy a Mercedes? Is it because that's what it costs to build the Mercedes? Or do they get something, do they get a value out of it? What I think they didn't hold was that people cared enough about the environment. But I'm not sure people buy it for the environment. It's a status symbol. And it's just a different way of selling a luxury product. And to, to a degree, you have money to waste on saving energy. Is, and that's sort of a very cynical view, but that's kind of what the product is. It's, yeah, it's very much a status symbol. Yeah. Along the same lines, I'd like to get your comments on the HP slimming camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh. so HP has this camera that when you take pictures with it, it adjusts the aspect ratio to basically make you look slimmer. Mm -hmm. It squishes the middle. Yeah. So that wouldn't so do much for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think we constantly make products to make us feel better. Um, I know from my work at Philips, they spent a lot of time, you know, my office mate there did uh, software for cameras, for high-end HD cameras, and there was a ton of work at that end just to make everything really sharp except for the human face and to recognize skin tones and soften it because when you saw that level of detail, it was uncomfortable and people didn't look so attractive. And that, you know, to, to a large degree, I think of it more in a prop way. That's sort of this very sense of self. But the products that we possess are props in our lives, so this just becomes another prop. Yeah? What do you think of the, uh, the philosophical or ethical implication of finding an identity with products, material possessions? commercial products in that regard? Well, I'd say that's what people do. So I, don't, I don't think it's ethical or not. Uh, how, how do people understand who they are in the absence of their things? It, if you, the things are really the extension of your values. So I would put that back. I, I don't, you know, to me this is the reality. And we have to design within that reality. I can suggest that we change it, but I can't, you know. Not necessarily empowered to change it. You're suggesting that things and people. <coughs> Places, yeah. My, my sense of things is very large. Um, and I think, when you, especially when you start talking about religious artifacts, I, I have a colleague that looks at death artifacts. That's his area of tombstones, things like that. These are also the stuff in our life that are particularly meaningful, representative of our affiliations with other people. I don't see that in this tremendously commercial way, even though these are very commercial products. Um, and one of the things he was really looking at are new services for, um, like they're sort of like blogs where when somebody dies people can go and leave messages and sort of technology was allowing to the creation of this new product that allowed for this really great expression of people's affiliation with someone else. So to me that was very much in this identity space. Yeah. I was kind of curious about your research on the college students who created a digital identity through like Facebook and MySpace. Yeah. And then like you also tried to figure out like ask about the identity outside the digital digital world. Well we interview them. So like, we, interview. we meet them. Did you did you consider like having a Facebook profiles or like compare yeah. compare people who like don't use Facebook that much for different outside of yeah, so we, we, we looked for people, you know, we looked at the, I, I think we had something like 800 names. I said, give me the names of all the freshmen coming in that are over 18. And surprisingly, the admissions department did. And have an IRB, I was like, ah. Um, but anyway, then we really, we weighted this, you know, we did a screening interview to people that use these services a lot. Because we were looking at this behavior. and I, what I want to suggest, sort of also, I'm a designer, and I, my focus is to make the right thing. I have colleagues that are behavioral scientists. Their job is to find the truth. 
I don't do controlled experiment. That's not the kind of work that I do, but I think it's very important and it should get done. I'm not the person to do that work, though. I'm very interested in, in making things and what I can learn by making, not what I can learn by studying and controlling. But I, yeah. Yeah, I guess mainly I'm curious, like you said, I guess you asked the question of that is making identity construction more explicit. Is that a good thing or does that make it more neurotic? Right, and, and I, you know, I, I'm encouraging other people to go out and do that. Most likely I'm going to just cause something to happen through the things I make, but I won't necessarily know why. And so I'm very hopeful that some of my, my behavioral colleagues will pick that up. Because I think it's actually a very exciting space, and I know people at Michigan are really starting to explore the use of things like Facebook to see what people are doing with it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in the beginning uh, the example of the checker being a, a, a server for the machine. Mm -hmm. It occurred to me that actually, depending obviously on the organization where the checker works, what I found that some situation actually it frees the server to actually serve the customer or they can engage in conversation, they can do other things and even in the relationship with the machine they become supervisor, they just monitor, they know the price and so they monitor that the machine and the tags are doing the right thing. So I don't see actually that the serve the person become for a long time uh, a, a servant of the machine, but they actually develop their own identity. So it's a matter of how you use the tool and how right. you develop your identity through the tool. Um, and you increase, I mean, you work in the environment and you work, interact with other people. So the, my reaction, and I definitely <coughs> agree, like the, the view I'm taking is very extreme, but what I think it, it also does is it lowers the threshold to barrier of the skill skilled person I need to hire to do this work. I can hire a much lower skilled person to orient the barcode. And I think if you look at sort of the mass of grocery stores that are out there, what you've seen since like the 70s when people were really doing the key punch is you had checkers where this was my profession and this is a profession and I engage in the customers and I know the customers that shop here regularly to now we have a set of checkers at a regular grocery store, not a high-end place like a Whole Foods or a, a Trader Joe's, but a, at a regular grocery store that can't, they don't actually have the social skills to engage. And the only people they talk to are the other checkers. That, and so I'm looking much more at the reality of what I see in the world and not what the product would have to be. Obviously people like Whole Foods can use this same technology and, and hire a set of people that can use it in that way. But I don't think there's anything in the design to make somebody feel better about their work that increases their challenge. And challenge is so much a part of what makes people feel that they're doing a good job. There's nothing about this that's challenging. Yeah. How much did you, have any, did you find any, with, with regards to the two working parents situations, did you find at all that people were, part of their identity was actually being busy all the time? Or, or like where something where it would be really hard to break them out of that because there's actually that's a part of what how they identify themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's, the term we use around our group is that busyness is a moral good. That, yeah, they have this desire to be really busy, but they also have the desire for it to be effortless. And so we're not trying to make them not busy. We're trying to make them make it feel effortless. They still want to get a thousand things done. So we're not saying this will help you do less, but this will help you do the same amount. You'll still have to manage all of these things. We're going to give you fewer breakdowns. I guess I was referring to busy as more like the condition of the self rather than how much you're getting done. But yeah, I mean, but it's, yeah. it's hard for us to say. What we have is the, you know, what we can see. And I really look at Chuck Dara's work where he talks about this level of busyness. But I think um, do people choose to be dual income by choice? or not, and I think that's the kind of unanswerable question. And if you look at a lot of the work funded by Sloan, sort of that we've been digging into on dual income families, there's been a lot of work to try to get policy change, particularly for men. There's this relationship with an employer that maybe it's what men bring, maybe it's what the employer brings, but the idea that the man is single. 
that you have no responsibilities outside of your work and somehow like a man in a, a meeting can't say, I have to go pick up my kids at daycare. And whether that's because that man just can't say it and the employer wouldn't care or whether it's actually this culture the employer has created is very hard to say. But that's the reality that takes place. And I, you know, I think there's this huge difference between men and women and we certainly see it in what work means. of teamwork between the uh, individual and the machine or, or device come into your work? Yeah, um, not so much in this, but sort of in the, the work I've done on intelligence systems. It's a very mixed initiative approach. And we very much look at how do you create a sense of collaboration. And particularly as we go into the smart home work, I'm hoping to leverage some of those findings in this space. But I think you don't think of your home as working with you. And I think the constructions we use for things like user limit our thinking. Because if you think of things like the shrubs in front of my house, I don't use my shrubs, right? But I kind of use them in an identity construction way. So it's just even the term user framing all of the work that we do in a very wrong way. And how do we sort of move past that? to think of people in a very different sense. And I think it's, for me also, like, it's not this machine, which I can see collaborating with, but how does my house actually become an active collaborator? And I think that's a big transition. Yeah? Would you say the, the possession that you mentioned in the beginning is cultural or universal? I mean, would you say, have you only looked at America, or is it the same? I have only looked at it. Pittsburgh. Okay. Not only America, but so there's a lot of theory that has looked at this. Um, a lot of the research has been sort of very Western centric. But when you start to look at identity and possession, you can even look at a lot of the older anthropological work, looking at gift cultures, um, where possession has this completely different meaning. And the work I would, if you're interested in this, the work I would point you towards is David Graeber's book on an anthropological theory of value which is really looking at sort of three different models of how people have value in things that are sort of radically different than an American perspective. And I'm, so we're trying to harmonize our stuff in that space. Um, and to some degree, possessions like my relationship to other people isn't that different culturally, like how people feel about their children and what it, what it means to enact some of the roles is actually tremendously consistent. So I think my relationship to brands and that kind of stuff is very much more narrowly culturally constructed. Yeah. Uh, so I'm fascinated by the identity uh, stuff in a couple of ways. The smart home especially takes us a far distance from a lot of models of smart homes where the identity that is created tends to be one of like couch potato, right? It celebrates the couch potato, right? Because everything is out of my control. I can now unimpeded watch all the TV I want or something right. like that, yeah. right? And certainly that was my Philips uh, model. Which is, <laughs> yeah. So that's really um, interesting. So I'm wondering what the criteria are for what kinds of identities you decide to celebrate or support in your work. So I mean, you so I would say like we really look for what is the what does a family find and and generally we'll we'll ask them like what are the things you do as a family as a way of getting at that so for some families like gardening is this activity that's tremendously important to them and for others that's just work that needs to get done and for some it's going to grandma's for dinner that's that's the thing or going to church or or whatever it is but how do you design a home that still allows the family to find what it means to be that, them individually. The, the other challenge is sort of all of the, or sort of there are two main paradoxes. So the children want security. They want to feel like they're being taken care of. But they also want independence. They, they want to be left alone. And they sort of move back and forth between these two poles. And the parents want to feel like they're raising their kids, like they're doing things for their kids. And they want their kids to take responsibility. So you have these competing forces from these two groups that are constantly in conflict in the home, which, um, I think from an HCI perspective, a lot of people say, wow, the home's really difficult to design for. But from a design perspective, it's like, wow, that's exactly 
where the opportunities are because like at in a workplace it's kind of dull and boring like how do I actually make something with impact uh, I'm actually curious you, you mentioned the workplace it seems like uh, I mean your point is the idea is not to do nothing but to get things done and you have these issues of collaboration and it sounds like there are really a lot of parallels with the workplace right uh, well it's people have said the home is not about <coughs> efficiency and the, I would say the home is about efficiency, but it's about so much more. And even if you look at activities like cooking, where you know some people love to cook and it's a lot of who they are, their act of cooking is not to make food as fast as possible, but that the activity of cooking itself is particularly important. And it's the skill and the challenge of what they do that gives them that feeling. And so I'm saying, wow, look at that in this space of people not really working, but they're doing an activity that's giving them this great feeling about themselves. Does that inform how I actually go in and design work when I have to design a work system? And to stop saying, I can get these transactions processed faster, and that's the only thing I'm going to measure. It's important, but can I actually make people feel like they're better at their jobs in doing it? out into the workplace. Oh, no, no definitely. And, 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 uh, and <coughs> I, hoping that the work we do does, I probably won't be me doing that, but I think I'm hoping that, that it goes in that direction. And I think looking at the quality circle work from the, the 70s in the auto industry shows that there's a huge value in, in taking that approach. How do you get people to care about the work they do? I think you can apply it to education. How can you get students to care about their own education? And that's not really the model I see with my own kids in, in school, that they don't try to do that. They get them interested in the content, but they don't get them interested in their own learning goals. Is it solution technological? Or solution? Of course. It's HCI. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's much bigger than that. But to me, the idea of a product that can learn and know me and change has a much better opportunity to to participate with me in identity construction than this, which I can pick and choose and I can discard it, but it, it plays a very passive role or it plays a marketing role in that a company has said, if you drink this, you will be an athlete or whatever. And I can buy the image, but the product, other than just being a prop to get me there, doesn't actually go with me through that transition. So I think interactive products have a huge advantage in this space. OK, thank you. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.